Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for taking the time to join us in the Victoria Digital Innovation Festival at the PSC Institute Roundtable. I would like to start with our acknowledgement of country. The PSC Institute would like to acknowledge the lands upon which we each reside for this online meeting and to pay our individual respects to traditional custodians of these lands, past, present and emerging elders. Thank you. In the name of Trevor Piercy, we're a volunteer organisation that looks forward to develop and impact the immense capability and talent that we have in Australia to grow the adoption and local innovation across all sectors. In the past year, we've written on the measuring of soft power, where Australia ranks low on technology. We've been very active in the need to drive adoption of telehealth and provide greater telecommunications cover to rural parts of Australia. And we've had a lot to say on the development of a framework to govern the adoption and use of artificial intelligence within our society. This indeed is unique and no more so for the fact that we're broadcasting nationally to an audience that cannot sit around in a physical event. However, this uniqueness of course raises the question why we've not done this before, and whether this will be the new format that starts to bring together our collective thoughts, views and intentions on subjects of national importance. This is the very essence of our discussion today, where we have six speakers with direct industry knowledge and experience who will provide us with their pragmatic views on continued engagement of technology to build a stronger and more resilient Australia. Can we be bold? and adopt technologies that facilitate new ways of working and socialising? And what does this mean for partnering and collaboration between industry, government and our education research sectors? The format for today is that each speaker will be uh, invited to give us their perspective. Each has an impressive knowledge and background and their CVs are available for you to review. So our introductions will be short between speakers. We ask that you use the opportunity to engage with questions through the portal so that we may complete our panel and reserve some time for consolidated Q&A. We're also very pleased to have the Honourable Danny Pearson, MP for Essendon, Assistant Treasurer, Minister for Government Services and Regulatory Reform to start our meeting today. Thank you, Minister, for your time and your support. <laughs> And I'd like to give you the opportunity to address us now, please. Uh, well, thank you, Janet. Uh, and uh, before I open these proceedings, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners uh, of the land on which we are meeting today. And I pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be with us today. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity to open what is sure to be a great discussion uh, on how technology, how a technology-led economy can help us to create a resilient future. The Digital Innovation Festival is doing fantastic work, helping Victorians across the state to engage with technology, connecting them with the tech sector's best and brightest leaders. This global pandemic is having a devastating impact on economies right around the world. And Victoria is not immune. But our economy is resilient and we will get through this together. Victorian businesses, our citizens and government are using digital technology to adapt to the coronavirus restrictions that are keeping our communities safe. We are well placed to use our skilled workforce and partnerships with the industry to play a lead role in creating a technology led economy going forward. Digital technology and innovation are today's driving forces for job creation, economic growth, productivity and competitiveness in Victoria. Victoria's tech sector contributes $38.4 billion to the state's economy and supports more than 139,000 workers across almost 20,000 businesses. Over the last 12 months, 15 international tech companies have invested or increased their investment in Victoria strengthening our capabilities in emerging tech areas such as cybersecurity, AI, and data analytics. 
Digital technology is one of the priority industries in the government's long-term strategy to attract international investment and support Victorian jobs. This strategy will play a key role in Victoria's economic recovery as we rebuild from the coronavirus pandemic by creating jobs in areas set to drive future economic growth. In healthcare, we have seen digital transformation accelerate through use of more wearables and VR, telehealth technology, all major growth areas of biotech. These advancements enhance our ability to tailor healthcare solutions to individual needs. They'll also improve health outcomes and the reach of better healthcare into regional areas. In manufacturing, we see great opportunity for Victorian manufacturers to modernise their systems and processes using 3D printing, automation, augmented reality and robotics. And this includes mining and agricultural technology and solutions for advanced food manufacturing. And of course, there are other areas of opportunity as identified by the National Meeting of Digital Economy and Technology Ministers, AI, Biotechnology and Cybersecurity. Victoria leads the nation in startup and tech funding with more than 65% of Australia's funding market share. Over the past few years, global reports have placed Melbourne as the nation's leading tech city and most innovative city. We invest in local businesses, entrepreneurs and forward thinking technology through programs such as Launch VIC, the Victorian Business Growth Fund and establishing Australia's first multi-million dollar accelerator and investment fund for AI scale-ups. We recognise the government also need to uh, digitise its services to better meet the needs of Victorians. This means using technologies to improve internal government services for an efficient and productive Victorian public service and external government services for citizens and businesses. We have supported Victorians shape government decision-making through our online consultation platform, Engage Victoria. In total, over 248,000 individual contributions have been made on Engage Victoria, including contributions on key policy reforms like the Mental Health Royal Commission terms of reference. We've supported small businesses with their research and investment planning through the My Victoria platform. My Victoria is an open data visualisation platform that gathers and combines over 50 open data sets to support Victorian small businesses draw meaningful location-based insights. We have also recently launched the developer.vic portal, Australia's first whole of government shared API portal. The portal provides developers from across the Victorian public service and the community with tools and resources to access a library of APIs from across the Victorian government and integrate with Victorian government data. Throughout the response to coronavirus, Victorians, businesses and government have shown our resilience in adapting to the new COVID normal. We've found new and innovative ways of transacting and engaging with each other, leaning heavily on digital technology and collaboration. I'm looking forward to listening to today's discussions. And once again, thank you so much for having me today. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, uh, for your um, introduction and guidance really in terms of uh, the opportunity that exists and what is really being done. Many would only see this behind the scenes. I'd now like to introduce um, Bronwyn Le Guais. Uh, you know, clearly, the health sector has been one of those sectors that's received uh, so much pressure, uh, so many issues, and uh, has so much opportunity for change and transformation, which many of us have been talking about for a long period of time. Sometimes it takes a, a, a significant event uh, in order to affect some change. Bronwyn, love to hear your views. Thanks, Dennis. Um, so, thank you, Minister, and I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all seated today, pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Um, I'm going to use some slides, which I, apparently I'm the only person, but anyway, um, just to talk about some work we've been doing. So, in terms of uh, what we're doing, my background is in healthcare commercialisation, both in drug development and devices, and the last five to six years specialised specifically in digital health. 
So I want to talk to you about this, the, trans, the changes we've seen in, in the adoption and the potential for the digital health sector, which has largely been um, simmering away below the surface and not necessarily attracting specific funding initiatives until COVID. So um, just to put that into context, it is one of the fastest growing investment classes in the world. $70 billion was invested into growth companies in digital health over the past decade, representing a global uh, compound annual growth rate of roughly 27.5%. And Anhealth is the, Australia's only organisation that is specialised in the commercialisation and acceleration of digital health companies into the global market. So we have the only team in Australia now that is highly specialised and focused on the, the specific commercialisation requirements for digital health companies, as opposed to a more traditional medical device or biotechnology product. Um, and, and just to talk about digital health, you know, we, we, there's a lot of digital health buzzwords around at the moment, telehealth being a big one. But, you know, for the last 20 years, we've been talking about mobile health and e-health. Um, I think the big thing to remember is that digital health in an international context is not just about data, it's not just about electronic medical records, and it's not just about telehealth. It is a quite complex sector where we use technology to deliver everything from platforms on which we can run more efficient hospitals, platforms through which we can deliver consultations virtually, through to actual technology uh, um, applications which deliver clinical benefits that are analogous to the, what you would get from taking a new medication. And so what we talk about in this sector is not just digital health, but digital medicine. So point of care diagnostics that are connected to the internet that can diagnose whether or not you might have a viral or a bacterial infection in your home before you enter a potential community setting. Um, but digital therapeutics, applications with clinical evidence that prove that they can sustain uh, life-changing reductions in, in HbA1c levels in type 2 diabetics. These are all technologies that are regulated. They attract quite a lot of clinical risk that you have to invest in clinical trials and commercial trials before they get to market. But based on our world-leading health and medical research sector, we actually have a, a, a digital health sector that is globally competitive but is yet to really be supported by targeted funding initiatives that's been bubbling away. In terms of how we do what we do, and this will be very quick, we have a business investment and R&D model that allows corporate partners to invest via us and therefore get a screened and curated and supported um, experience around the development and commercialisation investment into the program. We worked with 10 companies. Um, over two years in our pilot of our scale-up program, and they've all raised over $30.5 million in less than three years, uh, generated almost $15 million in revenue. But more importantly, in the last almost less than three years, they've created 188 jobs, and they have undertaken 33 clinical studies, and they have impacted over 90,000 patients. These are companies that are going global, and they're changing the world, but they are also changing people's health. We did a report, we've worked with 350 companies now, the first 320 or so were captured in a report we recently um, published. And you know, it's really interesting to look at the data because this is not all about um, step counters or wellness initiatives. These are companies that are looking at some of the most complex chronic and acute conditions that we see in the clinical environment. There is a heavy weighting towards diabetes and lifestyle conditions only because I think it's really well understood how consumer behaviour change directly relates to outcomes there. But also we're seeing huge amounts of innovation in mental health, uh, central nervous system technologies, which include helping to manage things like multiple sclerosis, um, gastrointestinal, infectious disease, gynaecology, you name it, there are companies out there innovating in this space in Australia. Um, many of them are focusing on self-management and, and empowering patients. Um, in terms of bringing the patient into their own healthcare, we know that delivers better clinical outcomes. It's also cheaper for our healthcare system. Notably, very few of them are focused on medical records and, and the digitalisation of medical records. They're really focused on patient impact. In terms of end users, we've seen this data shift substantially during the, the COVID uh, pandemic. So originally we were seeing um, uh, quite a lot more weighting towards patients and consumers, but now really putting the hands, uh, putting technology in the hands of our frontline primary care network and using health practitioners to drive uptake and, and also the forced um, kind of destruction of resistance to things like telehealth has really enabled the practitioner community. But what's interesting to, for us, because we, we want these companies to be scalable, right? We want them to make money and create jobs, is that 
there's a big tension between who's going to use their product and who's going to pay for it. So patients rarely pay for clinical grade healthcare. We have a government pay system here in Australia. But also you can see the example there, 36% of these 300 or so companies think that health practitioners will be their primary end users, but only 8% of them think that the practitioners will pay for it. And this is one of the biggest barriers we see to, to the uptake of digital health is it's extremely hard to find a revenue model which will work on a scalable um, way. And often the revenue model has to change from country to country to fit in with the payment structures around healthcare that exist. In terms of um, end user setting, again, where is this technology primarily going to be used? Really worth noting that the majority is going to be used in the home or the workplace. This is about shifting care from the, from the clinic to the home. Medicine has always been about data. It's just that data was collected by the physician sitting down and talking to you about how you're feeling, how you were feeling last week, and the data is collected in the consultation. Imagine a healthcare scenario where the data is collected as you live your life because uh, actually, knowingly, patients are extremely unreliable at reporting their own data anyway. But, the, but that data is already collected. Your clinician is ideally reimbursed to review that data before you meet with them, whether virtually or face-to-face. -face. And that data can then be monitored to, to start to, to identify leading indicators. So your conversation with your doctor is not, how are you feeling? It's, I see that your glucose levels have been really volatile at 10 p.m. every night. Can you talk to me about what you do at 10 p.m. every night that might be triggering these responses? Or I see that at you know, 10 p.m. every night, your heart rate goes up massively. Why is that? And I would tell them that's because my three and a half year old has come out after being put to bed at seven for the 18th time to tell me that she's done a poo so she doesn't have to go to sleep. But you know, um, we all have these life things that impact our health and that data and it, um, allows us to identify, and sorry for the poo reference for everyone that's not a mother of small children. Um, so I think the end user setting and we see, you know, the shift of um, care to the home, but then these things have to be paid for. And interestingly, only 9% of companies think that government will pay. And so these are companies that are also innovating in their business model. How do they create a health economics model that will get them paid for their product and, and the clinical impact that it has? And so it's a really diverse sector. I'm super excited about it. And this is one of the reasons why. The outcomes I posted earlier from June, if we go back to what those companies have done up and cumulatively until December, we look at the last six months, an exhausting time economically, mentally, um, has seen many companies go to the wall and beyond. Our 10 companies have actually raised another 18% of companies. They've actually um, increased the number of clinical trials they've done by 40%, increased the number of patients served by 70%, and increase the jobs and employment by 30% and revenues are up by 54%. This just shows what a technology, a technology enabled healthcare system can deliver, not just in better healthcare, but in resilience to future health shocks in terms of jobs that are really, really um, integral to um, how we respond to pandemics. And so for me, COVID-19 has represented a once in a lifetime opportunity. I have been talking uh, this from this hymn sheet for three years and have never had so many people actually wanting to listen. Um, but let's think about how we can use technology to create a healthcare system rather than a sick care system. One that is affordable for us as a nation and for individuals. One that is accessible to all Australians, no matter what disabilities or where they live or, or you know, how their lives might be impacted by disease. One that is scalable, it's effective, it delivers clear clinical outcomes, it's resilient and it's personalised. And it's also an export generating uh, industry. And, you know, there's a lot of regulatory change and, and you know, we talk about um, 10 years of regulatory reform around telehealth reimbursement happening in 10 days. Let's go beyond that. What does virtual care look like? How do we get these therapeutically validated digital technologies into the hands of patients so that they can actually live better lives between their appointments and that their doctors can make decisions informed by real world data. And so um, that's it from me in terms of my, my spiel about how healthcare should be driving our technology led future. And I thank the minister for his comments about the sector here in Victoria. It's one of the reasons I set up and health here in Victoria. I've been involved in the biotech sector for 20 years here. Um, and I really want to thank you, Dennis, and the Pearcy Institute for having me along today. Thank you very much, Bronwyn. That's a great start to our uh, panel discussion, I think. Uh, firstly, 
uh, we all know just how good the level of innovation is in Australia. It's not a question of do we have it, it's a question of adoption and the opportunity. And you've outlined how wonderful that opportunity actually is. But of course, it does take sometimes, uh, you know, a compelling event uh, to push people over to realize that uh, we have the capability to transform the way we deliver services. It's a data driven industry uh, in the heads of the of the physicians. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Ian Opperman and, and get Ian's perspective from a data point of view. And I know that Ian could talk for three months on this subject. So I'm interested in how you're going to get it into 10 minutes. Thanks, Dennis. And I can do that without drawing breath for those three months. <laughs> Let me also begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, which, which I'm joining you today, the Gadigal people of the Euro Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. We also add one important point that New South Wales has been on a digital journey for quite some time. Uh, until the end of last year, I was running the New South Wales Data Analytics Centre, which was the first of its kind in Australia, which was really about using data to address wicked policy challenges. I kept up at the end of last year uh, because my hair was changing colour too fast and I was ageing beyond what was normal. And then COVID hit. And the role of a central data analytics function inside government became abundantly obvious. And the ability to connect data sets together to assist with the health response, to better prepare, identify vulnerable communities, better improve situational awareness, better understand the areas of greatest need and to look at what ifs and to look at different ways of optimizing suddenly became abundantly obvious. Everybody's desire for data increased. Everybody's understanding of the value of data increased and the years of painstaking, slow, careful development of governance frameworks, data sharing framework suddenly was needed by everybody. Apart from the actual pandemic component, it was a really wonderful time. But we were looking at the response in terms of really three main phases, the prepare, the adapt, and the recover. The prepare is, is something that, that we've all been through, and some states, some regions, some jurisdictions, some economies in the world are in fact still going through. The, the adaptation is really where we started to go digital and where the opportunities really started to emerge. We very rapidly went online. We very rapidly moved to these sorts of meetings. We very rapidly moved to tele. I was looking at a survey recently carried out by the Remote and Regional Medical Services in New South Wales of patient experience of telehealth. And the majority of patients had a positive experience of telehealth. And the majority, in fact, almost 100% of patients expressed fear about getting COVID whilst visiting a GP or visiting some sort of physical health environment. So that rapid step towards telehealth was an amazing adaptation that happened overnight, except overnight was almost 15 to 20 years in the making. We also saw a lot of rapid digitization going online of service delivery. And we've looked at point of sale physical versus point of sale online as part of our understanding of economic impact in New South Wales. And it's remarkable which businesses we're able to and those businesses which really could not remote their, their offering because of the need to physically be present or, or the need for a range of, of in-contact requirements. But it showed that far more of the economy could actually be done remotely than we ever really seriously thought was possible. Now, in the recover phase, many, many times I've heard the expression about putting more tarmac down or keeping the cranes in the air as the way of leading the economy. There is a bigger, better opportunity. One of the things about going is that we have looked at all the different stages that might have been done physically, might have been done partly digitally, and very rapidly had to work out how to create that entire customer journey in a digital fashion. That's also meant that we've been able to find a lot more of the kinks, a lot more of the points of friction in that digital journey. New South Wales had been on that journey, looking at a range of different customer services with the creation of the Department of Customer Services after the last election. And we were looking at things like getting a job, birth of a child, death of a loved one, and looking at all the different forms and non-digital things that needed to be done in some cases physically, and looking at how we could rapidly join them together, create that digital journey, identify the points of friction, pull those kinks out, pull those points of friction out, 
but then start to think about how we might do things differently. The digital driver's license was a great example of that. It, it started out as just a more convenient way of getting a license. But all of a sudden, it's realized that there are a whole lot of other services that you could link to a digital driver's license. All of a sudden, we started thinking about the art of the possible and thinking about the outcome we were looking to achieve as opposed to just driving efficiencies in the system. Now, we'd already been preparing through not just New South Wales, but through the Australian Digital and Data Council for every state and territory in the Commonwealth, working together slowly to build up those joined up services for some of the most vulnerable communities, not just looking at interjurisdictional issues around getting a driver's license or birth of a child, as important as they are, but also looking at really important life journeys for some of the most vulnerable members of our community. The National Disability Insurance Scheme reform of that scheme through a data-driven understanding of what the journey of someone in the scheme is like, or the journey of a provider, or the journey of a family, as seen through joined up data. The power of that, we're now starting to really genuinely realize because we've used so many more different, innovative, novel data sets to work through those phases of prepare and adapt. But the recover part is still where the greatest opportunity lies. Our ability to use data and digital services relies on a couple of very important things. It relies on safe sharing of data and in fact, privacy preserving data sharing techniques, which believe it or not, Australia is taking a leading role in developing international standards related to privacy preserving data sharing. It's a global problem. Australia has acknowledged this problem and is actually leading an international work program through the International Standards Organization. There's also a great opportunity for AI. When you link so many data sets together, there is a genuine opportunity to not just do things in a slightly better or faster way, but really think about doing things differently. That requires not only outcomes thinking, but application of massive amounts of data processing through machine learning and artificial intelligence. And New South Wales is just about to release its AI strategy off the back of its smart city strategy, off the back of its beyond digital strategy. I note the minister's comments earlier about the AI hub in Victoria. But there's another great opportunity, which is just around the corner, and that's the use of digital twins. The opportunity or the potential to better understand the planning, the construction, the, op the use of, the maintenance of, and even the optimization of everything, starting with smart infrastructure, talking about smart trains, talking about smart cities, talking about smart places, but ultimately anything is an incredible opportunity that if we get the transparency right, the security right, the privacy right, and the data sharing right, is an incredible opportunity that Australia is also taking one of the world leading positions on. Transport for New South Wales and spatial services in New South Wales are both leading lights in Australia in terms of building and adapting digital twins for their particular needs. And once again, the world of standards has acknowledged that digital twins are the way of the digital future about making things smart. And Australia is taking a very active role in the different components in that space. So I'm going to end by saying that we have moved a long way during this crisis. And we have really appreciated and understood the value of data really appreciated and understood the life cycle of insights from situational awareness to prediction to what, I, what if to optimization that's possible through the art of careful governance focused data sharing which preserves privacy. The potential in front of us is to capitalize on that, seize that ground and start to think about really big complex outcomes frameworks whether they be smart cities, whether they be reforms to the NDIS, whether they be reforms to any system and embrace that challenge because we've shown that we can do it, we can move quickly and we can do more than just joining up the different pieces and doing things slightly more efficiently because we've done it digitally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. As always, uh, very concise and explicit and it's uh, very refreshing to see some of the work that's um, actually being done. And particularly, I think here, uh, as you mentioned, and we'll come back, I'm sure there's questions uh, that are flowing through here on the change in the trust model between uh, those who understand what we can do and those who um, uh, are nervous about what we should do. And that brings me to uh, introduce Matthew Newman on applied 
AI ethics uh, and what we've been doing. And it's interesting that Ian mentions that. So I'll give the floor to Matthew to talk about where AI is and some of the challenges and the opportunities. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Um, yeah, afternoon. And uh, I'd like to echo uh, my co-presenters, uh, giving thanks and recognizing the grounds on which we meet today and uh, paying respects to leaders past, present and emerging. So I'm going to actually look at uh, just uh, uh, the kind of after the, the pandemic scenario. So I'm going to look forward into the opportunity we have and the subject I'm going to talk about today is around AI ethics. Um, my background is I've had 20 years uh, assisting organizations uh, in implementing change. So that's uh, uh, mostly technological change in the past 10 years. That's been very much about the way that uh, uh, organizations embrace automation and then more recently machine learning, artificial intelligence. Now, um, AI ethics as a subject is one that's gaining more uh, awareness. Um, I think we see more and more uh, newspaper reports, more reports on the TV, et cetera, with various uh, scare stories and horror stories. And uh, a lot of that focuses on the really big ticket things, you know, the, the uh, killer robots, um, those kind of, uh, you know, uh, disaster scenarios. And a lot of the focus has been on the big tech companies, you know, the, the familiar names, Google, Facebook, et cetera. But what I want to talk about today is um, a concern, but also an opportunity for the, uh, the smaller organizations. Now I'm gonna try my best to keep within my time. I have a stopwatch in front of me, but please do shout if I go over. Um, so uh, a lot of the regular organizations, um, the ones we're familiar with, the industries uh, we're familiar with across, you know, for instance, financial services, telcos, et cetera, um, they've got a, an interesting dilemma which has been made even more pressing by, um, by COVID and the kind of um, urgency that's brought to a lot of uh, their business. Um, and that, that dilemma is a recognition that this technology provides a, a lot of opportunity. So, you know, specifically around machine learning, AI, but also quite a lot of uh, other innovative tech. There's a lot of opportunity here to actually thrive, to better serve customers, uh, be more efficient, but there's also risks involved. And those risks are ones that are becoming more and more transparent to our leadership teams. And as such, they're starting to kind of caution their approach and, uh, and uh, how they embrace this technology. But there's an opportunity. Um, the opportunity is that you know, there are ways of dealing with this, there are ways of handling this, there's ways of addressing these risks. And if we get this right, um, there's an opportunity for Australia uh, to actually thrive and to become uh, leaders in our ability to implement technology in an equitable uh, and fair way. So, um, 1920s, um, yeah, the, the 1920s were uh, the roaring 20s. I put the 2020s down as a decade of decisions. Um, not quite so thrilling, but it's, it's an opportunity because we, we get to choose now. Uh, a lot of the decisions that we probably made uh, within our organizations, within our business, within society, um, has been uh, hidden by the uh, by the, the kind of complexity of, of life, the complexity of human decisions. As we move towards using data to drive a lot of our decisions, we now are presented with a choice. We are presented uh, with a choice of uh, how we use the data, how we use the record of our past uh, decisions, and whether or not we want to continue that data to, or to use that data to continue to make decisions, and whether we actually want to, uh, uh, to continue some of the biases, some of the um, unfair um, uh, occurrences and some of the, the darker aspects of, of human decisions uh, into the future. And the thing is, is that's uh, a choice we must make because uh, as this technology is uh, implemented, these choices uh, are either going to be made explicitly in an informed manner where we weigh up uh, what we want to be as a, a society, as an organization, as individuals, all those decisions will be taken kind of implicitly as people uh, code uh, different models and systems have created, et cetera. So uh, with that in mind, what does that actually mean for an organization? Uh, how can they really embrace this decade of decisions uh, to, to thrive and to actually uh, to, to, to deliver better? Um, now, like I said, a lot of the the, the um, discussions to date have been around the, the sort of the idea of national regulation, international regulation, a set of rules. 
that can be put in place that uh, that kind of put guardrails in for what organizations can and can't do. Now that's extremely important. Uh, however, there are limits to how much granularity can be provided within that regulation. So, um, you know, if we're talking about some of the big ticket items or things like, you know, should we have killer robots? Absolutely, we can have those uh, discussions at a uh, governmental uh, global level. But for your average organization who's you know, looking to use uh, AI to do better customer service, for their marketing teams to try and you know, segment the market better, to uh, better identify new customers, um, for HR teams who might be using this technology to better understand their workforce, who's likely to stay, who's likely to leave, the best people to hire, et cetera. When you look at those kind of decisions, a lot of those are going to fall within the, the realm of an organization to understand uh, what is acceptable, what is permissible, uh, what is going to delight their clients and their customers, and what is going to disgust them. And to date, a lot of the conversation on this has been very much around this area of the development team. So um, the assumption is the development teams are the ones who are putting this technology together. They're the ones who get to decide if it's a good AI or a bad AI. They're the ones that get to decide if the outcome is positive or negative. And that's just not realistic. Uh, um, and it's uh, also unfair to the development teams to some extent. Uh, all developers work within the context of an organization that has a set of goals. And those goals uh, flow down from the, the vision of an organization for what it stands for what it believes in, what it prioritizes, you know, does it prioritize cold hard cash over its customers' well-being, et cetera. Um, and those, that vision and their self-identity an organization flows down into the kind of business goals it's trying to achieve. And from those business goals, the developers get their lead. They get their understanding of, you know, when faced with trade-offs and decisions on how to implement, how they should respond, when should they flag concerns, when should they not be taking decisions, when should they be escalating decisions, et cetera. And even after these uh, systems developed, it falls to the end users. Uh, you know, a particular model that's developed for positive purposes uh, in a different context can be absolutely misused. So within organizations, there's this set of decisions that needs to be made. And, you know, the, that may be made in isolation as an as a organization or for some industries, we may even start to see a sharing of best practice. You know, if we can get some sort of agreement between, for instance, you know, financial services organizations on what is uh, kind of acceptable and uh, best practice, that makes it a lot easier for them to compete uh, in a positive way within a sort of constrained environment. Um, we're talking about collaboration um, and the, the collaboration comes in that these organizations can't perform this on their own. So there is a, you know, a very urgent need for um, academia, for advisory organizations, and I'm slightly biased because that's my background, but also from regulators in the regulatory environment to collaborate into that decision uh, set of decisions to assist the organizations in making these decisions. You know, academia bring the latest thinking, bring understanding of the decisions that are being made. Advisory organizations have you know, years of experience on actually how to implement these decisions within organizations, how to get the plumbing right, how to get the frameworks right, etc. And regulators play a much more positive role if they work with organizations to understand the risk presented by the decisions that are being made by these organizations. And then most importantly, uh, these decisions have context. Um, you cannot make decisions about the acceptability of a technology, whether uh, certain trade-offs are acceptable or not acceptable, without actually understanding the context uh, that these systems are being deployed within. So that means understanding your customers, but also understanding your employees, and vitally understanding the local community in which you're actually uh, implementing systems. Uh, this is a, a local discussion. It will vary depending on geography, depending on the culture of the, organ of the, the society in which you live. And will also be time-based. As we've seen with COVID, what was acceptable last year at this time is completely changed as to what people view as kind of tolerable and acceptable now. And that will be different again in 24 months' time. Some of the decisions made now, for instance, on uh, um, uh, sharing location to, to track uh, infection, you know, those are probably going to or may well fall out of favor within months. So it's important to understand that this conversation on understanding these decisions is one that's ongoing, it is not a one-off. So 
hopefully I haven't gone too far. Good. Um, so what is needed? Uh, you know, if Australia is going to thrive in this new environment, we need to uh, set up a discussion, ongoing discussion between uh, experts, between the organisations that are the vehicle that these technologies uh, are delivered through and within the context, the environment and the society in which they're delivered. And that is this ongoing inclusive conversation uh, to, to approach this new horizon of technology. But here's the thing that's important. Um, this, this is learnable. This is something that's doable. If we look at companies, for instance, like Lego, Lego did really well at actually embracing the, the voice of their customers, understanding what they like and what they don't like. This is something organizations can learn to do and they can get good at it. And perhaps Australia can be great at it. And who knows, perhaps we could even be the best at doing this. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, you know, AI, and as I said earlier, um, our voice around the whole issues associated with um, an ethical framework and how it impacts our life, the lives, these, these are big questions. And impacting our lives and impacting the lives of others, what we've seen during COVID, um, strangely enough, was an opportunity to take everybody off the street and use hotel rooms that uh, were vacant. Uh, you know, we've done some things that humanely we should have been doing anyway. And uh, that I think is a great opportunity to hear from Jess Perrin, the head of social in innovation. And I'd love to get your perspective, Jess, on what has this period and, and technology done for the whole of that sector? Yeah, thanks, Dennis. I'll, I'll do my best to answer a, a complex question. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me today and for those who've joined online. I've always enjoyed the events held by the Pearson Foundation, so I'm very pleased to be involved. Um, I'm joining you from my dining room on Wurundjeri Country here in Melbourne and would also like to acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging and any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people that have jumped into this Zoom meeting. Um, as usual, the PC Foundation have brought in quite a heavy hitting and inspiring lineup for today's session and I'm really humbled to be involved and what I've thought about is how I can bring the perspective of the social impact sector along with my own reflections to the, to the challenges ahead of us. Um, and the homelessness example you touched on there, Dennis, is um, a really pivotal one to discuss, especially in the pandemic. Um, to set the scene a little bit, as, as coronavirus was kind of taking a hold on Australia and just before the, locked, um, the shutdowns um, took strong effect, there was a huge operation underway in Australia's capital cities, essentially to get around 7,000 homeless people off the streets and into hotels, motels and empty student accommodation. Now, the pace and scale of this was, is totally unforeseen and it was clearly a drastic emergency measure. Uh, but I think the important thing that has happened here is it came as no surprise to the charity sector that has been wildly successful at solving a problem that for years has seemed impossible to crack, getting long-term rough sleepers off the streets into permanent accommodation with a chance to rebuild their lives. Now, homelessness is solvable in Australia and the, sim the solution is actually quite simple. More homes and more support. That means an increase in social housing and more wraparound support to those who have been doing it really tough. Um, there's a substantial role here for the government to play, but also the private sector to play in investing in public houses to bring this to fruition. And I think we have a unique opportunity in time to continue to use this momentum we've gathered through the initiatives such as um, the hotel accommodation to ensure a long-term strategy is put in place beyond a crisis response. Now, with that in mind, it's actually cheaper to solve homelessness than it is to treat it, which is kind of what we're doing with the hotels at the moment. Um, at Info Exchange, we have a website called Ask Izzy, which was designed with people who have lived experience of homelessness. Our intention with Ask Izzy was to prevent people falling further into crisis by providing support systems earlier. Um, one example that is always really kind of front of mind for me, I attended a conference in Adelaide last year what a time that was where you could travel into state and, and see people in person. Um, and there was an incredibly interesting speaker from the US who'd done a really powerful piece of research into what could have prevented people entering homelessness in the first place. And they interviewed a number of rough sleepers and determined that their spiral into homelessness could have been prevented for the sake of a couple of hundred bucks. Um, the examples that spring to mind for me were a man who'd been um, persistently rough sleeping for over a year 
and the research kind of concluded from his own perspective, if he'd had access to hire a car, he would have driven to his mum and dad's place in a separate state and been able to get himself back on his feet and have a roof over his head to find a good job. Another example of a woman who fled family violence, um, she wasn't able to take her ID with her, which meant she couldn't get welfare. Um, and she didn't know the process to get new ID. She didn't understand how to navigate the system and that forced her down a path um, of homelessness. Now, organisations such as Launch Housing know what needs to be done in this space and in light of COVID, pressing a fairly large reset button, now is the time for us to think about how we build back better by coming together as a community and demanding action around homelessness through industry, government and community collaboration. Now, this brings me to kind of my next discussion point, which is really around a broader view of the charitable sector. Now, charities play a critical role in supporting and strengthening people in communities in Australia, but they also have a crucial role to play in Australia's economy and its recovery from the impact of COVID-19. Uh, often overlooked is the fact that charities contribute 8.5% of Australia's GDP and they employ more than one in 10 people in Australia. That's over 1.3 million people. That's around the same number of people employed in the retail trade sector, or more than the employees in, in construction or professional services or manufacturing industries. It is substantial. Um, Minister Pearson, thank you for, for joining this session. At, at the beginning, you mentioned manufacturing startups and tech here in Victoria, but Victoria is absolutely a leading state for social impact with many of our leading charities being based in this state who have a lot to bring to our recovery. Um, just last week, an organisation named Social Ventures Australia released a compelling report on just this and the importance of charities as we look to rebuild Australia's economy. For anyone who wants to deep dive in this topic, I would really recommend the report. It's worth a read. It also touches on, um, for the people who have fared the worst through COVID, what it means if there isn't the safety net of the charity sector there to support them. Now, we know the jobs that the charities traditional offer are going to be critical to economic recovery. Sectors with high concentrations of charities, such as healthcare and social assistance and education and training, are two of the three sectors expected to, to contribute the most to job growth in the next five years. These sectors are also disproportionately employing women who have been a cohort hit particularly hard through COVID. So while COVID-19 has really shaken the charity sector and the livelihoods of the many participants, staff, employees and volunteers, charities are managing the confluence of service disruption, falling income, rising demand and high operating costs. Before the crisis, Charities, unfortunately, uh, were already relying on thin margins and don't have a big buffer of reserves to draw on. They, we face, they, we as a sector, face um, many constraints to the regulatory, operational and cultural environment. We know that charity revenues don't recover from downturns in the same way that business revenues do. Um, and they can't easily access the resources we need to rebuild and transition to a new normal. With all that in mind, a thriving charitable sector is absolutely essential to our recovery from COVID-19. It will, of course, help improve the economic productivity um, of the country, but also the well-being um, of individuals and communities. So the question I thought in my mind is, what, what does the charity sector need to actually aid these efforts? Um, social ventures in that report suggested they need a chat, we need a charities transformation fund to transition organisations to the new normal. Now, by virtue of the way that we are funded, charities don't have much financial margin or untied funding, um, which means it's really difficult to invest in capacity building and organisational transformation to prepare ourselves for a post-crisis world, um, such as the ability to deliver services online, to develop a new business strategy, or importantly, to develop staff capability in this area. Um, interestingly, and in parallel to the point above around staff capability, this morning PricewaterhouseCoopers released some survey findings um, from a survey conducted with charity CEOs across Australia. Um, the key finding was that more than three quarters of not-for-profit organisations see digital upskilling of employees as a higher priority because of COVID. Um, that obviously comes as no surprise to us on this call. But from an info exchange perspective, um, this is very much known to us from a technology view. We are a social enterprise and a charity, which means we generate revenue through the provision of services and products. 
We're also a tech company uh, that is looking to boost the capability of the charity sector, whether that be through our client and case management system, which allows consistent data collection for government reporting for over 5,000 charities nationally or our focus on building digital skills in vulnerable communities. Just as a, as a quick example and especially after hearing Matthew speak on AI, we recently did a technology in the not-for-profit survey with close to 500 charities participating and it showed that less than 5% of them were making use of AI. We know firsthand how far behind the charity sector is on technology curve and it really has to change. When we're thinking back to limited money and minimal margins to be able to do that, how are charities going to invest in crucial digital upskilling of staff and procedures so that we can be nimble, flexible, and make rapid decisions in times of crisis? This is potentially where the Charities Transformation Fund as suggested by SBA could be crucial. Uh, as I wrap up, it's very clear we all need Australia's charities to make it through to the other side of the crisis in a financially viable position and in the long run to be more financially sustainable when they came to it. Our economy and our communities depend on it. Government, philanthropists and charities need to work in partnership to ensure that we can make that happen. This COVID reset button that has been forced on us is really an opportunity for us to build things better than put a band-aid on an old system. With that in mind, I'll pass back to Dennis. Jess, what can I say? Uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful to hear you bring all of those elements together as a chairman of a charity myself, I know how difficult it is to, to provide the services that you need to provide when you're using other people's money. And, and the charity is, uh, has a greater level of governance than most of the AXS uh, listed companies. So, you know, during a period like this, it's been very, very difficult for charities. And I, and I thank you for bringing all of those elements together, particularly because often when we look at opportunities people look at the cost of the opportunity and not really the benefit and over the past two decades um, providing benefit and looking at how you measure value in order to be able to do something in the beginning to make an investment is something i think charities are very good at but it's something businesses are not so good at and i it brings me to introduce a, a, a long old friend of mine adjunct professor Stephen Alexander, who in this area of value proposition has been banging a drum for more than 20 years. Um, and it is, it is a process by which we need to start to think to work. And I think you've echoed on that. And I know Bronwyn sees that in terms of great innovation and opportunity, but sometimes people just don't understand its true value in order to be able to invest in it. So Stephen, I think we're very keen at this stage to hear your thoughts and views, having listened to some of the speakers this morning. Thank you and welcome everybody. And first of all, my warm respects and acknowledgement to our Aboriginal elders and all its peoples. And uh, I speak as a Welsh person where we had elders in, in, uh, in our society. My grandfather was a bard and would everything was passed on verbally, all of the, 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 the laws and cultures. So it's something I, I feel very warm towards. Right, I'm gonna to cut to the chase here. I've listened to everyone and thank you so much for the input. And I'm going to, I've been making notes. So I factored in, um, Jess, thank you, what you were saying in terms of some of the key points on homeless, uh, homelessness. And if you look at the root cause of why are there homeless? Why can't people afford housing? And you always keep, I always keep coming back to the root cause, then you can see that until we grapple with that, um, we're going nowhere. And, and, I, and, and, and with Ian, it's just like if you look at their governance, and there was a number of things in terms of, yes, with the world we're aiming, we're heading towards fast is real time everything in terms of data, but that can't be addressed until governance. And ownership, privacy is an issue, but actually, until you solve who owns data, you can't actually automate governance. You can't actually create agreements which are actually binding, uh, 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 you know, in law. And it was the bit, it was, you know, and I'll start on that point because um, that was one of the big issues on our health in, in Australia. I was involved with Jane Holton. I conceived the idea of a personal health record being the first cab off the rank. And it was an event in Sydney where we had a whole international gathering. And, 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 and it was something no one wanted to go near. 
and they still don't. Okay, uh, only the World Bank has really identified saying it's the individual, it's theirs, make it theirs. Uh, and it's the most cost effective. It also deals with a lot of the liability issues, all right? Because one of the problems is when you look at value, not benefit, a health record has a clear benefit analysis done. Cost benefit, it's, a, it's easy. But if you look at it, is, a, is it of value? And to, within the context of everything of real life situations, then it's not of value to a lot of people. Okay, especially the especially the the practitioner, because there's unforeseen or unforeseen circumstances when you start meshing everything together and start automating it. Firstly, it's liability, public, you know, and 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 Dennis was organised me to come and meet and try and negotiate that through in this country. And the bottom line was from GPs, it's like unless you give me immunity from prosecution, I ain't gonna I ain't gonna do it, because all of a sudden you can you can audit decisions, okay? Decisions in a process where harm happens just by treating someone with, 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 uh, with medications. You, there, there are non-avoidable harms and avoidable harms and, and malpractice. All of a sudden, the downside for GPs was that you're gonna open them up to uh, prosecution, all right? Which wasn't thought of in the process in the first place. And of course, it comes back down to you can't actually solve that problem until you work out, well, who owns the data and who owns the rights to it and who's actually liable for um, validating in variance of truthfulness. So I think the point I'm making um, in terms of a few points I make, if I'd like to look at it from a global perspective and from a holistic perspective, which is what I practice in my kind of, if you like, advisory role, but in particular in teaching, which I'll focus on today. And, I, and the other thing from an Australian point of view, one of the things that, that was hit at that meeting with, with health, and we had the guys over from the States and, and Europe, all the big heavy guns, and they were saying, Australia's not big enough. It doesn't matter. You can't actually create a standard. You can't create a marketplace just for Australia. It doesn't add up today. All right, so, because uh, 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 we don't have enough people, okay, so to, to, to build stuff. So where does that fit in it? when you start moving into truly globalized uh, marketplaces, unless you've actually mapped out your good idea within the context of all of those to determine whether it will work. And you do that by determining what problems it solves, what operational pain and friction and human friction and what value impact. And I think the difference I'm talking about with value and benefit is value in the context of the methodology and the ability to capture it and measure it. It's the value impact of a benefit. Okay, so a health record is, of a, be is a benefit to have one, it obviously is. But when you look at the health, the, the value impact on individuals, organizations, entire ecosystems and economies, that's when you can start to make some sense of that. You can measure, predict it before you spend your money. Very often I get called in after the money's been spent on projects which are billions of dollars and even and the most fundamental questions were never asked ahead which is what's the value will they adopt it will they use it will it actually meet what their, their needs you know as opposed to just being terribly aggressive and confident and push something through so that was so there were some very critical things that looking at uh, uh, that area and uh, if you look at health records they technically have worked since the 1960s, but they've never worked in terms of ROI, um, you know, return on investment, or do, do people get better as a consequence? Have we improved population health care because of the health record? Okay, and, 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 and very often when you look at it backwards and you analyze it backwards on why they didn't, again, it's because there's, as soon as you start joining everything up, as soon as you start putting real end-to-end -end processes, especially in real time, and automating it. Uh, Dennis's mantra, favorite mantra, was always where you, you automate the good and the bad that you do. You can just do bad things and stupid things faster and cheaper along with the good things unless you've actually really understood it. So the question that was asked to me, what have I learned? And it's 30 years, Dennis, I'm getting really old now. You know, what have I really learned? And I was teasing him saying, well, not a lot. I've learned that I know a lot less than I thought I did. And, what I've, and by that, I mean that I actually now have learned 
that rather than just assume, you have to keep drilling down and digging down to see what is the benefit. What would be the benefit to Australia? What would be the benefit to all the parties of anything that you're introducing into an interconnected world that's interdependent on everything? Okay, and that's, that's really what I've, what I've learned. And I think um, what, what, I've, what I've, if I step back and cut to the end chase, what would I actually recommend that we do? Of looking at projects because I mean let's be let's let's just you you got to front a lot of the pain and the reality and the truth it's very painful 60 percent plus of all technology projects worldwide by our own accounting fail have failed will fail okay 60 percent of they want to ROI of those 60 percent 40 are catastrophic ask any government the bruises and the pain of the amount of money spent Okay, so we've got to get it right. Okay, and then when you look at, well, did, but, and did it actually have its intentional outcome, public, you know, in the case of government, public, public values. So if, if we're not very good at that, and we keep repeating the same mistakes, what I would recommend is we let the, the young look. They're unencumbered with expertise. They don't have, you know, they don't claim to. So they're not blindfolded with what we think sh the way it should work. And we work with them. And, we, and most of all, we work with them to understand crowds. What, what will happen, new kid on the, on the block, isn't the top-down governance and corporates and we line it all up, that everyone's going to be interconnected. They're going to be powerful, really, really, really powerful over the next few years as they can um, organize themselves and self-organize themselves. And they're the ones where collaboration, where the trust has to be developed. So I'd get young people with innovative, fresh thinking, unencumbered by expertise, look at the real level of the true complexity before we start trying to fix things so we can see it's contextual. Have a map, okay, of a complexity map. I'm, I was just, um, sorry, my timer. Right, um, 30 seconds. Uh, and just been talking with one of the state government health departments on, well, let's create a map so we can all agree on what is the world, where are the disruption tipping points, where are the, what's going to change, where are the points over the next few years where things will never be the same. And that anything that we're going to introduce in terms of a, a new capability, look at that within the context and then actually see whether it solves one or two problems or root cause problems or even complex wicked problems. And on a final note, if you give you an example on all infrastructure projects, I think um, Professor Brian Collins from UK, who said it in Australia, one of the leads worlding, one of the world's leading experts on, on, on infrastructure, saying no complex infrastructure, regardless of size or scalability, the money does not add up for investment. Okay, it, it, uh, today it doesn't unless you do two things. One is that you can leverage value of associated infrastructure by using a digital mesh so whether that's water you know transport health it's not good if it just benefits that sector it's got to benefit multiple sectors in order for the for the investment money to add up and he was given a not a notional hundred billion pounds to spend by the uk government on bringing uk infrastructure but he was referring to us in australia over here and the other thing is, unless there's a value in it, meaningful value that I care about, that I set criteria by, I'm not going to adopt, I'm not going to change. So it's those two things. And, then, and that's, what you, that's the acid test. Will they adopt it? Will they use it, the, the good idea? And, 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 and in isolation to the complexity of the reality, they look fabulous on paper until the harsh reality hits home. And so, for example, whether you're talking about a smart city, talking about healthcare, we passed the point of non-affordability in healthcare 10 years ago, worldwide. No one in the world can reconcile the two opposing forces of the, you know, the, 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 the expanding growing cost of healthcare, and it's going up rapidly, and the diminishing capacity to pay. That's it. So there is no normal new money. Any, any money that's required, you have to rob Peter and pay Paul. You have to show that, take money from here for my new thing. And, in, and if you accept this, that alone, then you start looking at your good idea in that context and saying, well, what is that value? Is it worth taking something else away? And you'll see that it can't have just inherent operational value on day one. It must benefit the whole. Otherwise, 
as, as Professor Brian Collins says, it doesn't add up. So that's my, that's my bit. And if we get, I think from here, if we got some of these bright young people from around the world, let's get the Australian young, that are new leaders, our future leaders, our future innovators, and, and some of from abroad, and, and get their help, get their buy into this. So as to check, do reality check on us. It'd be huge. Anyway, enough. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. And um, as we run a few minutes over time, I'm keen to, to move on and come back in a Q&A session to bring some of those points together of, uh, of the value process, uh, you know, who pays, who gets the benefit, uh, where does that reside? It's, it's been through every, every one of our speakers this afternoon. So thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for bringing us some focus in that. I'd now like to introduce um, Stuart Marshall, because, you know, when it comes to the things we're talking about, we, we often move away as individuals to recognise that nothing's going to happen if we ourselves don't start to make some change. And, uh, you know, we have to recognize that change is something that is inherent in us to uh, adopt, create, and be focused on and move forward. And so I want to introduce Stuart, who himself has made a massive change over the past few years, and is also now focused on and has a good lens at what is happening in the SME sector uh, to close us off for the afternoon. Stuart. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, I'll join uh, with the others in acknowledging the traditional owners of country throughout Australia, and I'm going to pay my respects, of course, to the elders past, present and emerging. And thank you all for coming along and listening. Now, I I've been in the IT world for 30 years, 20 of those in R&D and commercial software, creating high-speed development tools used around the world in industry and in government. So innovation is my life. It's what I do. and It's what I've spent my career doing. Uh, and right now, we're in the middle of a technology revolution. Uh, the likes of which we've never seen before. And I'm very much in the right place at the right time for once. And this is pretty much my happy place, were it not for COVID, of course. But while that's skewing our perspective at the moment, things will improve and we will overcome the challenges. And when we do, when the lights come back on, it's going to be full steam ahead and we need to be ready. Now, some might call our current situation a crisis, but personally, I think it's an extraordinary opportunity. And I say that because change has been forced upon us. And so far, we've responded pretty well to our immediate issues, but there are bigger games to play, and it requires us all to step up. And if we can get ourselves organized and collaborate across government, business, and academia, as we've been hearing, we have a once in a generation, maybe even a lifetime chance to, to leverage the latest, greatest, and emerging technology to transform how we live and how we do business today, and quite possibly for generations. But here's the thing. Digital transformation isn't just an exercise in technology adoption. There's a lot more to it. And in fact, I'd argue strongly that in itself, technology actually plays second fiddle to a far more important facet, which is, of course, us, which is people and humanity in general. And if we're to truly change our future, we need to transform ourselves first and foremost. And this is something I talk about from experience because it's a path I've been following for a couple of years or so, as Dennis said. Now, until the beginning of 2017, I was really just a typical senior software designer and project lead. And I was building the next big thing for a software business. But I was approaching 50, and in Australia, that's pretty much the cutoff point for IT guys. You know, finding another job once you hit the big 5 0 is hard, to say the least. So I found myself wondering how I'd spend the remainder of my career. And it seemed to be a simple choice. I could continue this sort of uh, comfortable status quo and have a gradual demise until some distant retirement, or I could take a risky transition to something different and hopefully far better. And after a lot of umming and ahhing and encouragement from friends, friends and family, I chose the latter. And so I put aside my not so trivial concerns, like what happens if I fail? Uh, will I ever work again? What if no one hires me? You know, all of these, and I replace them with what happens when I'm successful? Will I be able to pick and choose clients? What if I'm snowed under? And, and essentially I decided I would dare to dream. But if we're gonna be different, if we're going to be better, we need to do more than simply change jobs. We need to summon up a little courage because we need to change ourselves. And it's all too easy to take heed of our inner critic, that little voice in our head that tells us that we have no right to be expressing an opinion in public, our own personal tall poppy syndrome, ready to snipe at us from the sidelines and take us down a peg or two before we've even made a start. But George Bernard Shaw said, progress is impossible without change and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. And so I set about the painful business of letting go of my encumbrances and challenging my perception of self. And for me, this meant a significant metamorphosis in learning some new skills like marketing and selling. 
Now, my plan was to go from being a backroom tech boy uh, responsible for developing a commercial platform to an industry consultant helping businesses maximize the value of technology and to encourage them to build their own software to augment their processes and service offerings. But when you can describe your network, as I did in 2018, as, and I quote, everyone in this car, there's certainly a lot of work to be done. So how do you start? Well, as I regularly explain to SaaS leaders, you start by understanding the problem you're trying to solve. And for me, that meant developing a product offering, learning how to articulate my value, and most importantly, getting some exposure. And that meant getting published. So I did a course in entrepreneurial marketing and wrote a book called Doing It For Money, or possibly Doing IT For Money, I'm never quite sure. It's a business leader's guide to improving profit per person. And it's a book about how we use technology in business, but it's not about the technology itself. It's firmly focused on the needs of people working within an organization. And if we look after them, if we give them the tools they need to be the best version of themselves, they'll be more effective, more efficient, have better morale and so on. So yeah, all good stuff for helping businesses improve their bottom line. But of course, this is not an entirely appropriate subject matter for a guy with an R&D development background. But I chose this as much for my own benefit as that of the reader, because I wanted to position myself as something more than just a program and project lead. Now, I had no doubt that I had a wide knowledge and a vast experience to share. But from the outside, I looked like a software professional and pretty much not much else. But if we're to shift an external perspective and present ourselves as something different, we have to push our boundaries a little. We have to challenge ourselves and perhaps feel a little uncomfortable from time to time. So with some trepidation, I started hammering away at the keyboard and as luck would have it, I found that I thoroughly enjoyed the writing experience. So after 43 days and 60,000 words or so, a quarter of a century of professional angst, vitriol and frustration have been transformed into the first draft of my manuscript. Now few peer reviews, jud judicious professional editing and many, many readings later and a bestseller was born. But as valuable as the book has been, and it's certainly been very helpful, I was rather pleased to find it came with an added benefit. As well as giving me some much needed authority in my field, writing it helped me see a theme that had remained hidden in my thinking. I thought I was writing about technology use and improving profitability, but I realized I'd missed a far more important point. What I was really writing about was the needs of people and the relationship that we have with the tools we use. What I was writing about was the need for human centricity when it comes to technology design. And the more I thought about this, the more apparent it became that technology is kind of pointless without people. It's largely valueless until we give it meaning. Now, I've written hundreds of thousands of lines of code during my career, but it's useless without someone using it and making some value, something valuable with it. Similarly, the software leaders I speak with today are simply filling up some storage until they find some customers to put their work to good use. And even if we ignore the extraordinary capabilities of modern technology, the same rules apply. If we back millennia to the earliest of humans, there were doubtless many pieces of wood with a pointed end. But it was only when someone first used one to dig up a root that it instantly turned into a digging stick and one of our earliest pieces of technology. So all too often we find ourselves marveling at the magnificence of our brilliant inventions, almost oblivious to the impact they have on the people who use them. And this is something I encounter regularly in my work. And to help people understand my perspective, I use a simple statement and it's this. If we're looking at the technology, we're missing the point. Yeah, technology is just a tool. It's something we make for ourselves to solve our problems and to help us be better at whatever it is that we do. Technology is this human endeavor and it's something that as continu it, it continues to evolve as we have. So we started with simple tools, then we made it to water, as a steam power, electricity, motorized vehicles for the masses that travel in, two, in a two dimensional space. And maybe in a few years from now, we'll all be flying, uh, driving flying cars in three dimensions. All the time though, as our technology has advanced, so have our skills and so have the demands on us. The smarter and more capable our technology becomes, the greater the demand for us to learn more so that we can extract the best value from it. It's a kind of like a symbiotic relationship, if you like, a virtuous circle where we improve our technology and it returns the favor. But my own personal transformation is really a microcosm. And I'm just a bit player in a much larger story, which is the Australia of today and tomorrow. I wanted to transform from a programmer to a consultant. I needed to learn about marketing. So I took a course at the Wharton Business School. I wanted to write a book. So I learned about chapter structures and the hero's journey. And I've had to learn about selling too. And doubtless that will be uh, with me for the remainder of my existence. But much of this has been delivered to me on a laptop in my home office in Sydney. I invested in a combination of human wisdom and supporting technology to improve on Stuart Marshall 1.0. And it's enabled me to become a superior version of myself. Australia today largely depends on agriculture, tourism, and a booming resources sector. This is Australia 1.0, but the world is moving on and we must keep up at the very least. And to do that, we need to invest not only in our technology, but also in our people. 
As our tools become smarter and more capable, so must we. It isn't enough for us to simply rely on our elected officials to envisage and create a better world for us. It's incumbent on all of us to make that transition and to work towards a better version of ourselves. So 30 years ago, Bob Hawke called for a clever country and Malcolm Turnbull wanted this to be the innovation nation. But such lofty ideals aren't a promise to provide a solution. They're more of a call to arms. If we wish to take our place as one of the world leaders in technology, it's us who must transform. It's we who must take a few risks and it's we who must be the agents of change. If my own personal transformation is any guide, there'll be some considerable discomfort along the way, plenty of sleepless nights and fear and, and the reality of fear will never be far away. And the many software entrepreneurs I speak with will doubtless tell you a similar tale. But nothing worth having is free and there's always a cost. And just as I worried about the change that I had to confront to become a better version of me, so we must do the same. In Australia, we can stay where we are and we can enjoy our comfortable slow demise or we can dare to follow our dreams and the choice is ours. Thank you. Well, as always, Stuart, never, never short of a word or two to, um, I think, beautifully encapsulate. Thank you very much, uh, our speakers. There is so many topics that have been raised uh, over, this, uh, over this lunchtime panel that I feel we could, uh, we could certainly spend the, the rest of the afternoon. But the reality is, as you rightly say, uh, and Jess, I thought, put it beautifully, we need to start to move forward and think about how we deal with this opportunity and we deal, we deal with it differently. Um, Matthew's raised it. Stephen, sometimes uh, people get confused with a decision support system and looking at the value. Uh, it was said right in the very beginning, Bronwyn said, you know, people don't want to pay for healthcare themselves and yet they're the primary benefactor. We have a complex system, as complex as anybody's, but the reality is in all of the value propositions that I've looked at throughout business, including the health sector, but in business generally, the person who has to pay isn't the person who gets the greatest benefit. And so looking at how we collaborate, how we partner, how we move forward in that regard is extremely important. Um, building a resilient economy, uh, one, uh, one participant says here, uh, must ensure that individuals and small organizations have the tools to make themselves safer digitally. I totally agree with you. Uh, I think Matthew's touched on that in the ethics framework. And, you know, it, we thought it was kind of ironic that uh, we should have a framework for AI and yet try and look in the cupboard and find the framework for the use of digital technology generally. Um, so the reality is what the COVID brings to us is a recognition that there are some things that we've dropped that are socially responsible and important for us to actually have in our place. I see we've had quite a lot of conversation on the sideline through the chat, and I think that's extremely healthy. Um, we had envisaged, and I'm glad we couldn't actually accommodate two more speakers on the subject to specialising around partnering and collaboration, because I think each of your themes has touched on that. Um, and also Mal Thatcher, who would have come on, now a professor in uh, Queensland University, uh, previously run uh, all of the healthcare IT in, in Queensland and in the Mata Hospital, an expert in how do you take control of projects and make sure they work more efficiently and effectively. We've had a number of people raise questions here about how projects really work and how we make them uh, successful in the future. I think this has been an excellent, from my perspective, uh, set of uh, conversations, uh, a new way to go forward. And I'd like to invite my close colleague and chairman of the PSC Foundation, Wayne Fitzsimmons, to, uh, to say a few words on his observations, uh, because this is a key day for us in the the world of PSC as we had the oration this evening, uh, which again for the first time will be a virtual scenario rather than sitting around dinner with a nice suit and tie on and a glass of wine. Although I think I'll probably uh, certainly go for the glass of wine. So Wayne, your observations of this afternoon would be much appreciated. Uh, thanks Dennis. 
it is quite some uh, intellectual stimulation, I must admit. Um, having lived through this pandemic down here in Victoria, it, it, given myself and many of us, I think, um, uh, a pause for reflection on, on this topic. And I found it very challenging and highly relevant. So I don't, I know that this whole thing is recorded and we can get it, you can see it later on, um, on YouTube. Um, uh, but here's just some of the highlights that really struck me today. Um, when Bronwyn gave a very broad definition of digital health, which, which I found um, very enlightening because in digital health, I've, Dennis and I have been engaged on it for some time and that, I found that most in, enlightening medicine, therapeutics and, and so on. Um, but the shift to the user pay model versus the government pays, there's a big mindset shift because of the other speaker pointed out, you know, the costs are outstripping the ability to pay in any community and you see what happens in the US. Um, and to focus on, we're not, we've got to think more about not being a sick care system where we're totally reactive to being a healthcare system that is preemptive and preventative. And I thought that was a great observation. And then with Ian, who was very, very succinct. Um, and I've, I've heard him speak on this uh, topic before, and, and it's very enlightening. Um, the, the focused on outcomes and using big digital data, the safe sharing of data, you know, Australia leads the world in that, and AI will play a major role in, in doing things differently. And so, but there's a lot of challenges. Um, who owns the data? <laughs> um, the use of digital twins uh, is, got, is very useful and it's becoming more and more relevant. Transparency, security, data role, privacy, trust. Um, but the complex infrastructure challenges, such as with smart cities, which are now being rolled out, are incredible. And uh, the use of the digital twin uh, and big data is going to be crucial. Um, Matthew, talking about artificial ethics, it's something that Dennis and I uh, and, and some colleagues have been thinking about as well. Um, perhaps uh, it's been a bit too focused on disaster scenarios, and, and, and there is an opportunity for small businesses and organizations to really embrace, such as the, you know, the fintech and communications companies, etc. cetera. But um, the sharing of best practice amongst industry groups is a bit of a cultural shift. Collaboration is not a strong suit in Australia in many, many organizations, particularly not-for-profit industry associations. So ongoing discussions, not one-off. Um, we need to be able to facilitate inclusive discussions. Um, and of course, being inclusive opens people up and you become vulnerable and uh, Ian's last slide, I think, was uh, very relevant there. So Jess, Jess made a major contribution last year in highlighting the, the sector that she works in and social impact. Um, the broad view of the, the, the charitable sector, I was a bit stunned, 8.5% of GDP and one in 10 people work in that industry in Australia, which is a, a, a staggering, number for me personally. And she highlighted the need for a transition fund that uh, because they charitable organizations generally have very low margins. And the digital upskilling of the employees employed in the charitable sections uh, dealing with homelessness for a start is pretty, cr pretty critical. And so partnering of all sorts will be a much, much play a much larger role um, in when we press the reset button on, uh, on, on this COVID crisis. So over to Stephen, I, I think it's, it's, it's a profound statement to say, uh, until we figure out who owns the data, you can't really begin to roll out systems that include big data. It'll, it, it, this liability issue for the, as exemplified by the GPs, um, I don't care. But if I'm going to be sued, I'm not interested. You know, so somehow we've got to get beyond that. Um, and and I think the underlying concept of 
the value of the impact has to be some benefit. Otherwise, it's not going to have any lasting impact. So um, how you get there is uh, going to be incredibly difficult, but we have to, um, we have to, to get there. Um, uh, and I think, yes, so, so Stephen made the profound statement to my mind. So we have this in, incongruous dilemma in healthcare, the costs have outstripped the ability for us to afford. How do we, how do we manage that and, and get on top of it? Um, and that, that happened 10 years ago. So down to Stuart, um, um, I hope I'm, doing, I'm not doing an injustice here, but um, digital transformation is not about digital tech. It's, it's, need, it's more about how we transform ourselves using that tech. And it's about people. So, and also being prepared, if we do run a risk and we happen to be successful, we should not be surprised. We should be thinking about um, transforming ourselves to meet our newfound success. So thank you very much for pointing those things out, Stuart. And look, in the, just a few seconds remaining, uh, uh, I want to thank all of the pan panelists and especially Minister Pearson who uh, dropped off during the course of this event um, for making the time to join us this afternoon, especially to Dennis and his team, um, Leon Sterling, Joe Delvin, and Colin Farrelly for creating the environment that made this seminar possible. Because it took it, it took it took a lot to to create this concept um, and get it clarified. This is our fifth appearance at the Digital Innovation Festival, and we appreciate the Victorian government support with our six or so events that we are in the middle of holding over this during the course of this uh, festival. And I'd just like to qu quick plug for our upcoming PSC virtual and real events. Firstly, at four o'clock today, we're holding via Zoom the 2020 PSC oration, preceded by the 22nd presentation of the Victorian PSC Entrepreneur Award. If you haven't all registered, registered please, there's plenty of time and it's free, just go to the heritage.psc.org.au slash events and you will quickly see the event and its registration button, the same one that you use to register for this event. Secondly, of course, the High School Student Hackathon in partnership with Science Works and Museums Victoria. Uh, it's kicking off this Friday. I'm looking forward to seeing what those clever teams of students come up with as they consider how digital innovations might support Victorians adapt to change. This is our second year of involvement with ScienceWorks and the enthusiastic team down at Spotswood in, here in Victoria. Great partnership is developing. Last year we had an event and we, it was about computing and, uh, and CIRAC, which is located down there. A 14 year old boy from Shepparton stood up and asked one of the presenters at a closing panel who had just spoken about uh, quantum computing. Could, could she explain the link between Moore's law and quantum computing. And we all fell off our chairs. Um, I, I would also draw your attention to a few other great initiatives the foundation has on the go. We're currently writing a book, The Definitive History of the, Austra of the Australian ICT Industry. It's progressing well, where we, we hope to have the first half, about 500 pages done by Christmas, and we're looking for financial support. Queensland's holding its Entrepreneur Award on the 6th of October. It'll be real, but I can't be because I don't think the Premier is going to allow peop nasty people from Victoria to attend. So it'll be virtual as well. And we're celebrating the women's contribution to Australia's computing industry to be held on Ada Lovelace Day, Tuesday the 13th of October, as part of our New South Wales 2020 State Awards event on that day. We've got the PSC Medal Hall of Fame and National Entrepreneur Awards on the 19th of November. And every Wednesday, last Wednesday of each month, we're holding conversations. Details on these events are all available on our website where you registered for this event. Please write to us with your comments or leave them on this, uh, on this meeting, which will be, is being recorded and will be published. You can check, share your ideas, obviously, on chat now. And we'd love to hear back from you anytime how we might improve these virtual events. Have a great afternoon.